Hi, it's Katrina. My friend David is going to be helping me out with the voiceover today, so I hope you enjoy. Number 10. Mary Magdalene Mary Magdalene is the Bible's most notorious woman, but who was she? And what was her relationship with Jesus Christ? Her name was Mary of Magdala, and she was one of the original followers of Jesus. According to the Gospels, she traveled with Jesus, witnessed his crucifixion, and was in the group that first learned of his resurrection. But according to certain religious scripts that were never included in the Bible, Mary Magdalene may have also been Jesus' secret wife. Scholars generally agree that during the first few centuries of the early church, leaders downplayed her importance. They tarnished her name by calling her a prostitute, shaping her as a ruined woman who could only be saved by the teachings of Christ. But in reality, looking at non-canonical early texts from the first century AD that were banned from the Bible, Mary was Jesus' most trusted companion. Robert Cargill, an assistant professor of religious studies at the University of Iowa, says Mary was extremely important. Robert says there were thousands of early followers of Jesus, but only a handful had their names memorialized in the Bible. The fact that Mary is listed so frequently is a big deal. Robert also says it's possible that Jesus was empowering women in a way they had never experienced 2,000 years ago. It could be that some of his followers and the leaders of the early church grew uncomfortable by the female empowerment, and so the truth of Mary Magdalene was buried, and ever since, women have largely been barred from any kind of important church activity. Even today, the uncomfortableness of Jesus Christ empowering women pervades the church in every aspect of its business. She may have been his wife, she may have been just one of his companions, but she was certainly very important to Jesus. The Gospel of Philip even says Jesus loved Mary more than all his other disciples and that he often kissed Mary. Who do you think Mary Magdalene really was? Number 9. Jonah and the Fish The book of Jonah says that Jonah was eaten by a giant fish. Jonah spent three days and three nights in the belly of the fish waiting to be saved by God. It's a really interesting part of the book because otherwise much of the book of Jonah is historically accurate. It gives a fairly correct account of Assyria around the 6th century BC. Many biblical scholars believe the book's story is fictional, but the historical parts are presumably accurate. Even Jonah was likely based on a historical prophet of the same name, who lived during the reign of Amaziah of Judah. And then comes a giant fish, totally ruining any authenticity the book might have. Or could there really have been a giant fish capable of swallowing a man whole? It's doubtful, but the book could be referring to anything from a shark to a whale. Some have suggested Jonah was eaten by a whale shark, a creature that can grow to nearly 70 feet, 21 meters, and weigh 20 tons, 20,000 kilograms. It is possible that Jonah could have fit inside a whale shark's mouth. Then, because the whale shark doesn't have teeth, Jonah could easily have gotten sucked into its throat. Physically setting up camp inside the shark's belly, though, that's a bit of a stretch. And now for number 8. But first, it's shout-out time. Big thank you to Aces on Fire and Jennifer McNeil for supporting this channel. Number 8. The Curses of Revelation The Book of Revelation may have been partly inspired by evil curses. According to Dr. Michael Holscher from the Johannes Gutenberg University in Germany, the Book of Revelation contains language taken directly from ancient curse tablets manufactured in Rome. These tablets were written by ancient Romans as a way to bring bad fortune onto somebody, usually somebody who was caught cheating. Long ago in Rome, curse tablets were used by people from all positions in life. They could be used to gain favor with various gods or goddesses, and they could be used to cause people harm. Dr. Holscher believes it was this culture of curses that inspired a lot of the language in the Book of Revelation. Nothing was copied verbatim that the doctor could find, but the wording and phrasing is almost identical. For example, there's a passage that says, Thus with violence shall the great city of Babylon be thrown down, and shall be found no more. This language is almost identical to what can be found on curse tablets from Rome 2,000 years ago. Someone would have written on a tablet, Thus with violence shall my neighbor Joe be thrown down. The point the doctor is trying to make is that the book of Revelation may not necessarily have been predicting an apocalypse. Instead, it may have been put together like one giant curse tablet, trying to incite the destruction of all Christian enemies. Number 7. The Nephilim Genetic Experiment 
In the Bible, there are creatures called the Nephilim. These abominations were said to be created when angels from heaven came down to the earth and procreated with the daughters of Adam, the first man in the world. The male angels and human females were not supposed to breed, and so their offspring were despicable monsters. They were giants, freakish creatures that roamed the land for centuries. They roamed until God became so disgusted that he sent a flood to wipe them all out. When the flood waters receded, the Nephilim were gone and only Noah, one of Adam's descendants, was alive to repopulate the world with ordinary human beings again. What if this story really happened, but in a different way? Some scientists have speculated the Nephilim may have been real creatures, but not products of heaven. The theory is that Adam and Eve were indeed the first real man and woman, two of the first Homo sapiens. But they started inbreeding, and then their kids started breeding with Neanderthals who had yet to die off yet. They created a kind of mixed species of Homo sapiens and Neanderthals. But the mixed species was so ugly that they were hunted by ordinary humans. This story was then passed down through generations until it was transcribed in the Bible. There isn't much evidence for this theory, but it is entirely possible. It's also possible the Nephilim were created by space aliens who came down from the heavens to breed with humans. The space aliens were misinterpreted by people as being angels from God. What's your theory on this? Number 6. The Lives of Adam In the book of Genesis, we learn of the extraordinarily long lifespans of Adam, Eve, and their immediate family. 10,000 years ago, when Adam and Eve began to populate the world, people lived for about 900 years on average. According to the Bible, Adam lived to be 930. Mahalal El lived to be 895, Jared grew to be 962, and Methuselah beat them all at an astounding 969 years old. But then lifespans began to drop. The sons and grandsons of Adam kept living shorter lives until the days of Enoch prior to the flood. Enoch only lived 365 years, Job lived 210 years, Abraham lived 175 years, and Moses lived a measly 120 years. After that, human life expectancy dropped significantly until people were dying in their 30s. What explanation is there for the outrageous ages of people who lived during the Old Testament? Some have suggested the translations are wrong and that 969 years was meant to be 969 months, which would turn out to be 78 years. But there are many who believe it was sin itself that caused humans to have shorter lives. As sin became more prevalent in the world, human longevity was shortened. If people today want their kids and grandkids to start living to be 900, the only way they can do it, allegedly, is if they remove sin from the entire planet. Do you think with rapidly advancing technology and medicine that one day humans will be able to live this long again? Let me know what you think in the comments below and hit that subscribe button while you're at it. Number 5. The Apocrypha Most standard versions of the Bible contain 66 books. It's composed of the Old Testament, which took over a thousand years to write, before the life and death of Jesus Christ. The New Testament, written after Jesus, and only took about 60 years, give or take a decade. The Apocrypha are books that were written between 200 BC, after the Old Testament was already being finished up, and 400 AD. Most were written after the death of Christ, when Jesus' disciples were working on their own Gospels. These forbidden books of the Bible, known as Apocrypha, are one of the greatest secrets of the Roman Catholic Church. And depending on which religion you belong to, some of the books may be included in your Bible. For example, the Protestant Bible contains 14 apocryphal books, while older printings of the New Testament contained them all because they seemed relevant to the story. But then in 1534, they were taken out of the New Testament and published separately in their own section. They were given their own preface so that people understood they weren't biblical canon. These days, they aren't included in any standard Bible. The reason these books are forbidden is that they are considered dubious at best. This means the author is unknown, and so the books can't be accepted by the church as religious doctrine. The stories in these books are also a little bizarre. The Old Testament Apocrypha contains all kinds of wild stories about kings and events that happened in the past. For example, the secret lives of Adam and Eve, plus the truth of the demonic Nephilim that once ruled the earth. Number 4. Secret Gnostic Knowledge 
In the early days of Christianity, everyone had their own ideas about God and Jesus. For about three centuries, there was a struggle to come up with a dominant Christian religion. It was only in 312 AD that Emperor Constantine the Great officially made Rome Christian, smashing all the other religions. One of the religious sects that had been gaining huge popularity was Gnosticism, something the church would rather everybody forgot. Gnosticism is the belief that every human on earth contains a small fragment of God, a divine spark. The spark came from the immaterial world and into the filthy and corrupted body of the human. Gnostics believe all things in the material world were created by an inferior being of God named Yadabauth, and for that reason everything in the material world is evil. God to the Gnostic is a being so powerful and so beyond our understanding we can't even describe it. The only way for us to reach salvation is to forbid the material world and accept the knowledge that comes from God. One of their biggest arguments was that if God was perfect, he would not have created an imperfect world. And for that reason, God had nothing at all to do with our creation. It was a lot more complicated to get behind than the standard Christian way of thinking. These were two entirely different religions that argued about everything, especially the nature of Christ. Still, early Gnostics claimed they had secret knowledge that the other Christians did not. Number 3. Virgin Mary Milk Powder For hundreds of years, the Virgin Mary's milk has been a touchy subject. Devout Christians all around the world have had a bizarre obsession with the breast milk of Jesus Christ's mother since the 4th century AD. Even today, people still use Virgin Mary milk powder as a cure for ailments, especially infertility. Let's take a look at the Chapel of the Milk Grotto in Bethlehem, a place most people would never think is real. But it is and it's dedicated to the divine maternity of the Virgin Mary. In both the Christian and Muslim faiths, it's said that when Mary took refuge in this cave during the massacre of the innocents, she spilled some of her milk. The few drops of spilled milk turned the entire cave into a chalky white color, and so now it's believed the cave walls are coated in powdered milk straight from the Virgin Mother. The cave has been a place of homage for about 1700 years. The church was built during the Byzantine era, then enlarged in the 14th century by Pope Gregory XI. But the current chapel of the Milk Grotto wasn't installed until the 19th century. The milk powder allegedly comes from wall scrapings. People pay big money to get limestone scrapings in a small plastic bag. Then they drink it at home as a miracle cure, really believing they have the Virgin Mary's milk. Number 2. The Other Gods Nowhere in the Bible does it specifically say that there are no other gods. In fact, the Bible says completely the opposite. There are multiple examples of the Bible admitting to the existence of other supernatural beings and other gods. The one thing the Bible really drives home is that God, the Christian God, is superior to all others. All the other gods, according to the Bible, are just pretenders. In Psalms, there are multiple passages about how the Lord holds glory above all other gods. And in the book of Exodus, there is a passage that says God will execute judgment on all the gods of Egypt. This itself seems to suggest the Egyptian gods were real, but that the Christian god was much more powerful. Even in the Ten Commandments, the first one says, You shall have no other gods before me. That seems awfully suggestive that there are other gods, they just shouldn't be worshipped. Number 1. History of the Levites According to the Hebrew Bible, Aaron was the first priest. He was the brother of Moses and acted as priest at the tabernacle in the wilderness and then at the first temple of Jerusalem. It's believed the Levites were an ancient tribe who served as the assistants of the descendants of the first priest, having their own unique religious status. When the Israelites entered the land of Canaan, the Levites weren't given any of it. They were only allowed to attend altars and work as judges and teachers. They were essentially a tribe of priests dedicated to God, assisting with things like the slaughter of the Passover lamb. But then in the 7th century BC, King Josiah of Judah gave the Levites a little more power. They soon became an integral part of Jewish tradition. But when the Second Temple was destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD, they suddenly vanished. And although many Jews continue to identify themselves as Levites, even in the modern age, we don't really know what happened to them after the destruction of Jerusalem. 
The origins of the Levites are equally as mysterious and extremely diabolical. The reason the Levites were so important comes down to what happened in the book of Exodus. Moses ordered all who were for the Lord to go to him. All the Levites rallied and went to him. Then Moses said that all those who worship the Lord must go into the camp and kill their brothers, friends, and neighbors. The Levites did so, massacring about 3,000 of their brethren. It was for this reason that they were given special status and taken with Moses and Aaron into the land of Canaan. Do you really think the Bible admits to other gods existing? Let me know your thoughts and theories in the comments, and thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to hit subscribe and come back soon for more awesome stuff. Bye!